Okay, so uh, next up we have uh, Sofia Nikolov um, from uh, the Naturist Museum in London, and she's talking about cetacean resources at the uh, Naturist Museum in London. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me today. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, the Arts and Humanities Early Career Fellowship that I've been undertaking since December um, at the Natural History Museum with the support of Richard Sabin, uh, Principal yeah. Curator in Mammals, um, who's acting as my mentor. Um, so I'm based in the mammal section with him, uh, working specifically with the Cetacea collection, so whales, dolphins and porpoises. Uh, the two-year project is called Cetacean Resources, Reconnecting London's Natural History Museum Cetacean Specimens with the Legacies of Empire and Whaling. It's collection-based and specimen-focused research, um, and the project is funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council under a new pilot scheme launched to, to support postdoctoral level uh, research um, actually within cultural and heritage institutions, because there's not a lot of provision for that. Uh, the project is interrogating the role of colonial exploration, territorial and administrative expansion and industrial whaling in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, whaling, um, in contributing to the museum's uh, collection. And so it's really about understanding those transoceanic networks and movement of cetacean specimens across huge distances. Um, and ultimately reconnecting specimens with their places of origin as constructed through the lens of empire. Uh, so a bit about Richard and me, uh, this is a little bit like a CV. Um, I'm an environmental historian and I draw heavily on cultural history and history of science, uh, looking at the intertwined histories of humans and whales. I also take interdisciplinary environmental humanities approaches, bringing together literary studies, museum studies, post-colonial and indigenous studies, and insights from sciences. Um, I did my PhD in the School of English at Leeds um, and co-supervised by a marine conservation biologist at the University of York, but my first two degrees were in history. Uh, so it was a very interdisciplinary PhD. Uh, it looked at whale strandings in the Pacific Northwest um, and their cultural significances and the different worldviews and communities that surround this phenomenon. So science, science, settler colonial society and indigenous communities. Uh, while I didn't do any actual science, um, I learned how to draw together diverse fields, to work closely with people from uh, very different disciplines and how to bring um, research from sciences into conversation with my research. Much of my work, um, up until this point um, had looked at natural history specimens, the display of animal remains and museum collections, but always externally. Um, Richard Sabin, principal curator in mammals, he's been there for 30 years. Um, he is a leading specialist on cetaceans and other marine mammals. Uh, he's um, very much involved in collections-based research. He is involved in collaborative research. Um, and he has been um, working on the digitization of specimens, including through uh, 3D imaging. And obviously he's very much involved in uh, research uh, with DNA and stable isotopes. Um, and he's also been involved in arts and humanities collaboration, uh, really broadening uh, our, our access to the collection. Um, there probably isn't a more appropriate person for me to be working with, um, so it's an incredible opportunity. Um, as he... Oh. My slides are in the wrong order. <laughs> so my project also falls under the uh, collections and culture research theme at the museum. Uh, one of uh, several, I think there's 10. Um, so collections and culture has existed for about five years. Um, last year, cultural historian Dr. Isabel Davis joined um, to lead it, and she's actually acting as a secondary mentor for me. There's currently five dedicated arts and humanities researchers at the museum, so that's postdoc and above. Um, we're a pretty small group, but there are also arts and humanities uh, PhD students on collaborative um, 
uh, doctoral uh, training programs, uh, curators and research. Uh, curators and research researchers across sciences are uh, very much involved in this kind of research. Uh, you know, they really kind of laid the foundations for it. And of course, colleagues in library and archive. And it's all about growing and strengthening arts and humanities research ca capacity in a scientific institution. Um, you know, there's real value, I think, in having historians and other humanities researchers actually embedded in the museum and its collection. Uh, historians bring particular research experience, knowledge, and specialization. And we're grounded in theories from particular fields that we bring to bear on the collection. So, i.e., histories of empire, history, histories of natural resource extraction. So drawing on my research background, this project aims to generate uh, specimen narratives and biographies and to bring out the micro and macro histories of empire that um, kind of circulate around specimens. We also bring a particular set of research skills. Um, you know, we can work with huge amounts of written source material and we enjoy spending time in archives. Um, and this project relies on a huge amount of archival material. Uh, you know, not just within the museum, but uh, several external archives, and it seeks to connect all this material up kind of with specimens at the center. And I think Richard summarizes it quite nicely by drawing together information from disparate archives, the rich um, social historical specimen narratives will help contextualize collecting activities and their drivers. I also asked Isabel Davis as the lead on um, the theme for some of her thoughts on the project and where it fits within the museum. She reflected on the importance of Wales as an NHM symbol, especially with the redisplay of hope in Hinsey Hall as a species, a species brought to and back from um, the brink of extinction. But as Isabel says, we can't only tell a story of hope because we were also part of the world um, that damaged whale numbers and acknowledging the past is key to addressing climate injustice. She goes on to reflect that a lot of the work so far um, in terms of the decolonizing agenda has focused on other parts of our collections and has made um, serious um, progress in those areas and, and colleagues are really kind of leading this work in terms of natural history collections. Um, so areas such as botany um, or areas, uh, parts of the collection with links to slavery. For Isabel, this project gives the museum something new, um, a look at the relationship between empire, commercial organizations and natural history collections, but producing a different picture and in parts of the world less populated. So, um, you know, around the Antarctic. Uh, where we're looking at the impact of empire and extractive capital on animals and their environments. The project centers in on the gray areas between conservation, collecting history, commercial whaling, and the colonial office. These are not narratives of hope, but, but, com but confronting the past of our collection in new ways. So I'll just spend the next couple of slides talking about how the project is being supported. So firstly, working with Richard Sabin as my mentor, um, he's brilliant. Um, there has been a very proactive effort to actually embed me within the mammal collection. Um, and having this kind of access has enriched the project and its innovative potential. Close mentoring from and collaboration with Richard has, is you know, at the core of this project, particularly learning from his incredible knowledge about the Cetacea collection. Curators have in-depth and unique knowledge um, that is essential to any kind of historical research. He shares information about previous keepers of zoology, periods of uh, collection development, um, and research using the collection, um, and so much more. Uh, working with him has also offered in situ si insights into curation of natural history collections, which I think people it, when you come from the university sector, these things are quite hidden. You're not really aware of it. Um, it's been eye-opening, learning about the scale and variety of responsibilities. Um, gaining this internal perspective, um, you know, the breadth, the pressures, the priorities of 
curators has been in, uh, invaluable. And I think that it will lead to better, more successful and practical research collaboration in the future. I'm also learning how to handle specimens. Uh, we're going to do some curation of the wet collection together. So, you know, it's kind of a, you know, it's helping me to develop a whole range of skills. Thinking more broadly about um, how the museum is supporting it. Uh, as mentioned, I'm um, also mentored by Isabel Davis. <clears throat> and I think having arts and humanities affiliation and connection in a predominantly scientific research space is very important. Um, the project is um, building on and learning from um, the ongoing work at NHM by curators, researchers, librarians, you know, it's building on that. You know, I'm not sort of saying that I'm coming in and revolutionizing things. Um, the other thing is having access, really amazing access to that library and archive to have material that relates <laughs> to the work that you're researching kind of on site like that. It just is so conducive to generating um, really rigorous, efficient and good research. Um, and the other thing is that um, people at the museum are very good at facilitating you meeting others in the museum that you need to. Uh, so other curators, exhibitions, comms. Um, I'm really trying to learn how different sections work together and the process of getting specimens, the science and the research to the stage of public engagement. Uh, it's quite complicated and takes a long time, which I didn't realize. Um, the AHRC scheme itself is also very important to mention. So uh, it was conceived of by the independent research organizations. So the museums, libraries, archives, and heritage organizations that wanted to be involved. Um, so it's a very practical um, fellowship. Um, they want to give these new opportunities and give, um, you know, uh, that, that you, a kind of unique experience of working inside museums. It is the first funding scheme of its like, uh, of its kind uh, by the AHRC, and there's a commitment for it to work, to set a precedent and to potentially have future postdoctoral fellows. Um, it's uh, the coordination and development team are uh, based at the VNA. Um, so they are very much dedicated to the smooth running of the program. Um, or the admin, they support the fellows, but they also support the IRO hosts with any issues. Um, and they run a training program. Um, and that training program really kind of, I think, reveals their commitment to the development of fellows. Um, it's a two year training program. It's a mix of workshops and masterclasses with those in the sector to really support the kind of success of the project, but also the longer term success of the fellows in establishing themselves in this sector. Um, and then to conclude, I'll just kind of um, reflect on what the project is doing or trying to do. So um, very basically, <laughs> generating new information about the collection. Um, you know, and this will enrich enrich Richard's knowledge um, about it that he can carry forward with him. Um, and it, you know, it kind of creates that uh, legacy uh, with the curator. Things like accurate geographical origins of specimens, some of them um, just aren't in the um in the in the metadata. And it can really transform how a specimen is used by researchers if they know more accurately where it came from. Uh, information about collectors and donors, their links to science, colonial government, um, wildlife exploitation, but also the other actors involved um, who've kind of dissipated into the archive. Whalers, naturalists, colonists and settlers, uh, indigenous people, locals, um, it's also about contextualizing specimens in the historic moment of collection. So things like what was the level of species depletion at that moment? Um, what were government or public attitudes towards empire? Um, and then the other thing is understanding collection biases. So how did commercial whaling impact collecting? 
What are the species, size, age, sex biases? Um, Richard, kind of, I, I wanted to share Richard's reflections on the project. Curating a research collection beyond core requirements frequently leaves a trail of must investigates behind, <laughs> which time and other limited resources rarely allow a return to. The fellowship provides the NHM with an invaluable opportunity to enhance the cetacea collection beyond its essential metadata and to add to our understanding of the many biases which exist in the cetacea collection. It will help create populated and navigable links between the histories of British scientific expeditions and the development of early collections-based research. Okay. Um, so yeah, I think the main thing that I want to wrap up on is just that uh, the digital aspect of the project. Um, we are going to be producing digital photographs and 3D imaging and updated and enriched metadata that includes the historical information and the cultural information so that there is that access for researchers working on conservation in situ, for researchers in the global south, um, and broadening access to arts and humanities researchers. But this, of course, raises questions about uh, what decolonization means for migratory marine mammals, especially those that move through waters far from humans around previously uninhabited territories. Um, animals where there's no traditional relationship with humans. Um, and this is probably something that, you know, I'll be really grappling with over the course of the project. So thank you. Many thanks uh, to Sophia for an awesome talk. Um, does anyone have any questions about the project? Come on. Go on, Amy. <laughs> Great talk. Um, I'm just wondering, yours is the first decolonization work I'm seeing in relation to the marine environment. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to be almost overlooked. Is it the cultural in land animals, or would you like to speculate? <clears throat> so the question was about um, that this is maybe one of the first projects looking at marine mammals um, in terms of decolonization. Um, and, uh, you know, why is that? Is it because oceans are kind of overlooked and that we're land mammals and um, that sort of um, terrestrial bias? Um, yes, I mean, there is brilliant work going on in terms of, um, you know, confronting the colonial legacies of um, uh, oceanic uh, specimens um, in, I, I, I haven't really seen a huge amount in terms of marine mammals though. Um, I've seen it in, in, in other areas of natural history collections. I think that there has been a bias in the um, kind of areas of environmental history, particularly, um, which have focused on uh, terrestrial ecosystems for a long time. I mean, you know, it's only sort of in the past 10 to 15 years that you've really had that sort of broadening to look at the history of um, human interactions with uh, the marine ecosystems and, you know, marine animals kind of come after engagement with the space. Mm. Um, and I think that because of that lag in the kind of arts and humanities, that has leaked over into a critical engagement with natural history collections because it kind of begins there with the theories and the um, um, the, the sort of, um, yeah, kind of grappling with it in those spaces and then, um, but yeah, I think that things are massively changing. Um, I mean, I know that um, I think Miranda Lowe is doing a, um, supporting a, a new PhD that's looking at um, coral reefs and and um, the, the interactions with empire. So I think things are changing. Um, and I think it will potentially transform kind of how we think about um, our relationship with those animals and with those other species. Anyone else? Oh, yeah. Oh, two. Uh, okay, Helen first. Okay. Um, I would be thinking of the other that I've been doing to the UK for the information that's going on. Let's repeat. Yeah, uh, the question was about whether I'm linking up with other cetacean curators in the UK about information that they might have. Um, not yet. I think that it's the kind of thing that comes later in the project because 
the scale of the work within the museum um, is, is already uh, pretty huge. And um, I think it's important to maybe see how this works out and then what those relationships are with other cetacean collections. So obviously um, up in Scotland, you no, know, that's the major collection, but it differs quite a lot. Um, it's much more about, they have much more of North Atlantic species and, um, you know, their whaling collections come more from kind of Scottish um, whaling activities um, uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. However, it would be very interesting to find out whether there are these specimens that were going there as well from the Southern Hemisphere um, because of those links with, um, you know, the, the whalers in the Southern Hemisphere, a lot of them were coming out of places like Dundee. So there's strong connections there, but at this point, <laughs> because there's just so many specimens in the collection that I'm looking at and so many other archives that I'm having to work with, just to work this out, but long term, I think, yes. Um, you mentioned um, potentially being able to pinpoint geographic origins or specimens where they would be not directly associated with the um, So, um, Oh, sorry. The question <laughs> is about um, that I mentioned that um, I can pinpoint, you know, accurate kind of geographic locations and more specific geographic locations of some specimens. I mean, for some specimens, um, they'll say something like South Atlantic. That's it. That's a huge area. <laughs> Go, but the archives, I mean, the archives at the Natural History Museum hold yeah. so much information about these specimens. Curators just don't necessarily have the time to go in there to look kind of en masse um, at multiple specimens. So within that, you can get things maybe like South Georgia or the Falkland Islands, that's more specific. Sometimes there are coordinates, so you can pinpoint where they were taken from in the ocean. Um, and that just comes down to whether, uh, you know, the, the, the scientific expeditions or whalers noted down these coordinates. Um, but yeah, there are some specimens that, you know, um, already have that information that was inputted, but uh, loads of them don't. And it can really um, help researchers who are looking at population recovery and historic abundance in quite specific areas. It makes a difference when looking at um, uh, whale populations around South Georgia versus the Falkland Islands to work out, you know, they're, they're close together relatively, but you can work out how those uh, uh, greater pressures around South Georgia affected the whale populations there. So yeah, a lot of archival research. Thanks very much to Sophia for an excellent talk. Thank you. <laughs>